this past week was one of Xbox's worst weeks I can remember in its 20 year history. Now, if you were a fan of the brand, you heard things that upset you from Xbox itself or the complaints from those upset were hard to bear. Regardless, many people are trying to get to the root cause of this issue. But really, an RCA, aka root cause analysis, is not needed here. The problem's exclusives. See, Xbox placing their exclusives on rival consoles day and date, or fairly close to such, devalues the console. This is pride and true knowledge for decades in the world of console gaming, and self-admitted by a console provided just a provider just last gen. However, amongst the muck and smoke screens of fanboy battles via social media, this plot has been lost. No fret. We got plenty of receipts and frankly decades of experience here to back this all up. So to the question if exclusives matter or are they just over exaggerated, we will tackle all this on the next installment of The Spill, our gaming hot topic video series. Buckle up and get ready for a good one. Let's go. Yeah. What's up, people? What's up, people? What is up, people? It is your boy, MM2K of Hard Knock Digital Culture, Cloud Dosage, MM2K Gaming, which is here back again with another episode of The Spill. This is our hot topic video game shorter series. It's not a full podcast, but. You know, we try to make it shorter, but this is where we talk about the hot topic uh, of the day. And man, oh man, we got a great one for you. But before we get into all that, do us a huge favor. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and definitely rock those bells for notifications, please. So you know when we're dropping these doses. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to address this um, in two parts. And there's three things to address here. First and foremost, we want to address... Um, the misunderstanding around why losing exclusives matter to anybody pretty much that buys a console why they why they should matter unless you just like throwing away your money um and we're going to talk about the fact we're going to look at the business on why they don't just matter to businesses and lastly, we're going to talk about this theory that um, PlayStation is kind of like in a panic right now because it, it, this is the weird thing. It, it, <laughs> in, in both spaces, exclusives don't matter, but exclusive sales for every single individual exclusive title matter to the company I, I don't know we're, we're gonna try to make sense of it and we're gonna try to debunk it <laughs> all at the same time i know bear with us um but before we get into all that i want to talk about the the claims that came forth that kind of inspired this video right now i'm not going to pull up the individual tweets or the actual youtube comments that that sparked this video because the the tweet thread was is, is something that just needs to be debunked but the actual youtube comment that sparked this as well was actually a good question and it reflects on something that i failed to elaborate on for our newer listeners in um, a previous video that we did um all in all this is tethered to a podcast that if you're watching that podcast just stay tuned after this intro you'll get to hear all that live, all that discussion live, and you'll get to see the, the actual conversations. Um, however, uh, for the sake of this video, we're just going to talk about the notions all together and, and address them. So let's first talk about people being upset for no reason over the loss of exclusivity. All right. Um, and the, the, the crux of that opinion is that Xbox gamers are, look, getting games like Indiana Jones and Avowed or whatever ends up coming to PlayStation, they're getting them first. So what's the big deal? And also what's the big deal is, hey, look, they're coming to Game Pass as well, where the PlayStation people um, have to put money behind their purchase and not just be able to indulge in a subscription service, right? Okay, so that's the first claim. The second claim is, look, when it comes to exclusive overall, they don't matter. 
um the exclusive marketing behind exclusives and the rhetoric quote unquote behind exclusives is just only meant to fool gamers into thinking they matter but they really don't matter okay that's opinion number two and opinion number three is exclusives only matter to sony who in this point in time is only in a panic there are they're in a panic particularly because their games are not being played as much as other games in their marketplace and particularly because of concord um and the thought behind that is look sony exclusives must sell well in order for sony to survive in order for them to make money and survive and for their business strategy to work all of their exclusives must sell well right they need to eat off of them as, as i was told and then also sony really needs to le uh, lean on games as a uh, games as a service or live service for survival that's their current strategy and if that strategy falls apart then sony is in trouble and that's why they're in a panic right <laughs> all right so let's let's get past all that noise and let's go to the rebuttal of all this stuff okay so first and foremost to 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 debunk the thought process that people are upset for no reason over the loss of exclusivity I want to first show you guys this. Okay, you did it right. All right, thank you board or, or, or clipboard. All right, so I wanna show you guys something that I responded to from Jeff Grubb, which I thought was spot on. Um, Jeff Grubb said, but console gamers are, are used to feeling special when he's talking about the whole thing behind Indiana Jones and the fact that um, it's only a timed exclusive, even though it's a first party game, it's only a timed exclusive um, for a few months and then it's going to a rival console. It's rumored like three to four months afterwards. Um, so Grub says, but console gamers are used to feeling special. That's been the deal. We'll spend $500 on this thing and, 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 it ha and you have to do the work to make that feel like a good investment. A console platform just cannot square this circle and I don't think they're trying to. Right, and he's responding to somebody. And I echo that sentiment by saying, for those who don't understand the backlash versus all games being everywhere, like, again, that, that theory that it doesn't matter, exclusive, it, it, something being exclusive to a console, it, it just doesn't hold any weight. Look, a lot of money is going into these gaming devices. If the value slash support I get for my $500 versus the other $500 box is cut significantly, contrary to what I was promised, of course I will be upset. What am I talking about? Well, just this is just the ebb and flow when it comes to how exclusives apply to consoles in particular. I don't think they apply to every type of gaming service or gaming ecosystem type of thing, but when it comes to consoles, absolutely. And when it comes to what Xbox is trying to do, I definitely feel absolutely, even though they're trying to be everywhere, hear me out. You on the other end of this, you're, pri you're primarily a console gamer. Just pretend, right? You're primarily a console gamer. It's the best way for you to play. Trying to play AAA games, particularly on PC, is too expensive for you. It's just too expensive. I know people say, oh, but you could build a, a rig at the same price. Look, I, I, I'm not that technically inclined, nor do I even want to bother with it. It's too much for me. And then all the constant tweaking of settings, game to game to game, if I were to build a rig like that, that's, that sits around the price of a console, like, come on. No, it's not for me. All right. Um, you know, cloud gaming. Okay, look, I, I may like Xbox games, but I'm not a big fan of xCloud. xCloud does not give me the output and the performance that I'm looking for, even if I'm a Series S owner, right? So I'm a primary, I'm primarily a console game. So said console that I just bought, they put their exclusives day and date everywhere, right? Or close to release, kind of like Indiana Jones, right? Because they do that, they lose console sales because they no longer stand out. I mean, the fact of the matter is when you just even look at Xbox's PC day one strategy, a lot of their hardcore from last gen to this gen, and again, if you're just getting into this, this gen, right? And you're just getting into this whole console war debate this gen, you don't realize what happened last gen. You don't see the faces that you saw that were here this gen, I mean, that, that were here last gen, that converted in between generations your hardcore people which do way more spending per capita than the average gamer they go over to pc right 
So not only are you losing 30% of your first party sales, but if I'm a PC gamer, I'm not buying my third party games on the Windows Store. I'm buying them from Steam. We're seeing debates out there right now where PC gamers are saying that if the game ain't offered via Steam, it's not a PC game. I mean, it's crazy. It may sound crazy, but that's their approach. That's their perception. PC gamers are a different animal. So because of that, you're going to run into a situation to where your hardcore gamers are going to leave your console and not only do you lose 30% on first party sales, you're now losing uh, third party sales altogether. That means all the DLC, all the other stuff. Um, and I've seen stats out there by other people out there on social media that showed the decline in growth that Xbox experienced once they started putting their games day and date on PC versus Sony and Nintendo. All right. So it's, it's pretty much etched in stone. And we knew this, those of us that have been in doing this for a while, a lot of you that are new to this may not have, right? So again, they lose those console sales due to not standing out. Third party developers then look at the console itself and they say, well, if nobody's buying that console, why is it worth my time putting my game on that console? Look, it costs money to port these games. Is it worth the squeeze? Is it even worth the squeeze? And if you have a situation with, with Xbox gamers now where they're just inclined to wait and see if games hit Game Pass before they buy them, then that answer is, is, is by the day becoming no for more and more developers. All right. So again, console owner who buys the console, see the console maker puts the games day and date elsewhere. So they're losing those exclusives. They're losing, then the console starts losing sales because people go elf, elsewhere. That causes third party developers to look at what's going on and say, you know what? I don't even want to put my third party games on there. So you start missing third party games and you, the sole console owner, you lose out on massive content, which devalues your purchase. So even if you personally don't mind seeing exclusives elsewhere, they do harm you if you are a sole console gamer and you only game on one console, which I think fits into the realm and, and describes most console gamers. Most console gamers don't have multiple consoles, all right? Under that scenario, exclusives, quote unquote, wouldn't matter. Most console gamers settle down on one console, right? So, but let's do this. Let's talk about console exclusives and how they benefit gamers due to the risks that are not even taken with multiplat games. I want to show you guys something else. Again, remember how I said in, in, in the intro to all this that a platform holder admitted that this is the business strategy and this is what works in console gaming? Check out this from Shuhei Yoshida. He says only four out of 10 play, PlayStation games make money, but Sony will always support talent. And this is this came in 2014. He laid this out for those of us that were not in the know, that were ignorant to how all this works in 2014. And this has been the way that it works forever, right? What is that way that works forever? It's a hit driven business, he says. We look at our financial results of the titles and probably three of four out of 10 make money and maybe one or two make all the money to cover the cost of other titles. So we have to be able to maintain that hit ratio at a certain level to be able to continue the business. So we're able to find out, find out and support and help grow the talent. That's the most important work that I believe myself and my management team at Worldwide Studios are doing. Hmm. So right there, he's saying, we're willing to take a, he said only four out of 10 are successful and two out with two out of the 10 legitimizing the creation of the other eight. You know what that is mathematically, my friends? They are willing to take a 60% failure rate in order to make exclusive games. 
tell me what third party publisher is willing to, to take a 60% failure rate. None of them. I don't think no third party publisher can, so, that's doing AAA games at that can survive off of a 60% failure rate. But the reason why they do that is because the exclusives first and foremost are meant to sell consoles. If they do more, that's great. But Sony is not in the exclusive selling business. The exclusives are lore. They're in the third party selling business. And they're in the part in the business of growing their marketplace and expanding the, the, the reach and the value of their marketplace. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But understand the role exclusives play. Again, if you just slid, slid up into this into this uh, conversation the last few years, you're not going to understand the historical value here. And you're going to be led astray by the smoke and mirrors from people on social media. Do not do that. Always do your research. Okay? So that is the, the breakdown of the business model. Let's explain the breakdown of the financials. And this comes to us courtesy of uh, my good friend, Derek Strickland of Tweaktown. He is far from a PlayStation enthusiast, but Derek breaks this down for us perfectly. All right. It says here, PlayStation stats, third party game sales, dwarf first party sales. All right, let's go to the part in particular. This is a chart that he has up here that has legacy PlayStation 4 sales and PlayStation 5 sales up until fiscal 2021, right? The pink are first party sales. The blue <laughs> or uh, third party sales. So even in the year 2018, we had God of War and Marvel Spider-Man that just blew the roof off the mother sucker, right? Look at how much they were dwarfed by third party sales. This is traditionally the business. Why? Because even if this is hefty for a particular year, it lures you to this. This 15.6 uh, million sales leads you to the 207. That's where the money is made. That's where the gold is liquefied. The blue part, not the pink part. It's a lure. All right. Derek Strickland explains here, according to the data, Sony sold a total of 303.2 million games on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 across digital and in-store channels. While Nintendo makes most of its game sales for first party, Sony is much different. The split is significantly in the favor of third party games. In fact, 80% of games sold in Sony's fiscal 20, uh, 2021 period were third party sales. 14% were first party. And if you were to go even further, look at either even further historical data, you're going to see the same gap. This is a third party business that Xbox and PlayStation is in with their consoles or Xbox was in with their console. Now they're trying to abandon it. They're trying to find some other way to success. That's all another podcast or whole another video, right? So this is where the money is made. Third party sales. Not Sony selling a gazillion first party games. This is, they're not Nintendo. And look, frankly put, Sony is sell is making more money with this strategy this generation than they were last generation. What am I talking about? Oh no, MM, you're crazy. You know what you're talking about, man. You're crazy, man. You're crazy, man. You're crazy, man. You're crazy. Uh, uh, uh. This is a chart from a recent um, business meeting that they did, um, Sony did with investors, that shows a stronger life to date spin of the PlayStation 5 currently versus the PlayStation 4. During the PlayStation 4 life cycle, they averaged around $580 per console owner. But now that's grown to 731%. Well, let me tell you this. I'll just share this statistic with you. Gaming, particularly the price of games have gone up around 15% from last gen. Like we see games 
that used to be $60. Now there's $70, for instance, right? Now, 15% price hike is, is, is kind of global across AAA gaming, across the board. AAA gaming, right? The most expensive and the most money-making gaming for PlayStation, okay? The difference here exceeds that. This is 21% growth. So Sony is even exceeding the increased pricing, particularly in AAA gaming, that we're seeing by an additional 6%. I don't want to bore you with the numbers because I, I know you guys like to listen to numbers from people that don't understand simple math. And this may be confusing you, but you know, we're, we're, we're going to take it slow. Right? We'll just explain it like this. Let me, let me try this. Let me try an analogy here. Console exclusives are like bait, right? Fish bait to be more specific. So say me and you on the other end of this mic, we're in the fish selling business. We have fish markets and we sell the fish to, to, to consumers. That's, that's the business that we're in, right? And let's just say you, for example, you do a lot of R and D into exotic bait. You might use pineapple with pumpkin spice. You do a whole bunch of crazy stuff to try to catch fish and it works for you. In a day to where I may catch, and we both catch our own fish, right? In a day where I may catch fish to sell, I just use atypical bait. It's nothing great. It's just, it's just mid. It's mid bait. It does the job for me, right? I get like maybe a hundred fish a day that I get to sell, right? But you, you bring in thousands with your exotic bait, right? Again, your exotic bait is experimental. A lot of it works, most of it doesn't, but you're willing to take that risk because you are far exceeding the amount of fish that's normally caught by me or any other fish market, right? And that bait, the exotic bait that does do well, it does so well that you can go and take that exotic bait and you can sell it. You can sell some of that exotic bait separately and you make a lot of money off of selling bait where I, you know, I just need the bait to bring people over to, to my fish market because of the, of the amount of fish that I catch. But you can expect to make money off the bait alone, right? But just because you make money off the bait, you sell thousands of fish, and the bait helps you catch thousands of fish, that doesn't mean that you're in the bait selling business. Bait is extra. The bait is used to catch the fish. Selling the fish, AKA third party, third party games is the business. So I reckon back to what I told you before, what you Shuya Yoshida had said before, where he said, look, we're going to take a 60%. We're going to go through a 60% failure rate in these games, meaning six out of every 10 exclusives that we try are going to fail. He says only four out of 10 PlayStation games make money. That means 60% of them will fail, but they can afford that margin. A 60% failure rate, as long as it doesn't go any higher, they are good, right? So again, it's all about understanding the business, understanding the money that's being made in the business and understanding how to properly describe the business. This is not an exclusive business. The exclusives are bait. The, the Sony exclusives are so god dang on good that they, you know, they can they can be compared and bumped up to third party games. That's how good they are. Because again, they go through things and they take risks that a lot of multi-plat developers don't aren't willing to take because they can't afford the risk that Sony Studios can take. They got to have better margins than a 40% success rate. But again, the six out of 10 that fail, they bolster the lineup. They may look interesting. They may not land well when they sell, but they bolster the lineup and they make more people come to PlayStation than to Xbox. That's the business. Now, Let's address this other notion that Sony is in a panic when exclusives, quote unquote, don't sell well. 
right? Because you may look at that and you may say, well, MM, that's the old business. This is the new business, the new business, like the games and the service. That's the new business, right? Okay. All right. Um, well, before we get to the, it, it, whether it's the old business or the new business, let's look at how they're doing against the standards that are set. They need, at worst, a 40% success rate. 60% failure rate, okay? So let's look at the lag, because everybody said, oh, the, the PlayStation games are doing horrible. They're doing horrible because they're not all selling 18 million, which again, that's not the business, right? The business is the lineup looking appealing and bringing people over to the console. And then you got those two to four games that are so extravagant, they make so much ruckus that they put an extra uh, coat of gloss on the other exclusives. That people are like, look, when I buy my Madden, I want to play my Madden there. There's all those other games that they got that ain't elsewhere. But let's look at the last 10 exclusives to see how well Sony is doing. All right, now that you understand how the business works and how you should look at the PlayStation exclusive versus, oh, did this one sell 10 million? Did this one sell 50 million? Oh, it was a fail. It was a fail. Let's look at the 10 exclusive, the last 10 exclusive games including Concord, to be fair, and see how they did. Did they reach the 40% success rate or not? Okay, let's start with, we're gonna work our way current, then then um, back. Concord, it's a parent flop. I, I, I don't look, we, 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 don't, we don't talk doom and gloom about this game. I don't see it coming back. But if you're listening to this as part of the podcast, um, you will hear us talk about that even further. But Concord is a flop. Stellar Blade, charted good. It was on the, um, the it, it released in April or May, and being that it had uh, a four month lapse in the year before it released, it still was like in the top 20 games on NPD year to date. That's a phenomenal thing to do. And the um, the developers themselves said that it was, it was a success. It's even helped them in, in their uh, bout to go public. It made them a more reliable company. So the, the game was a huge success for them. Rise of Ronin. Again, another game. Huge success for them. Was it the biggest and baddest um, uh, exclusive game? Didn't sell 10 or 50 million, but it charted well again. It also hit the charts, even though having a few months laps. It did what it needed to do. It bolstered PlayStation's lineup. It charted and it did well. It, it, it led to financial success for the company, right? Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's still charting. It's still charting year to date, and it's only available on the PlayStation 5. So it's still kicking behind, only being available on the PlayStation 5. Last of Us Remake. Hey, look. Remake is a game too. It's the, it, um, Last of Us Remake charted good, right? It charted good. Still doing well still making numbers and again bolstering that lineup hell divers 2 we know how that's doing <laughs> that's still charting good and it's bolstering the playstation lineup as well it brought a lot of people to the playstation bolstered that lineup significantly marvel spider-man 2 again that's still charting that's still doing gangbusters they just released um numbers that said it did over 11 million that's nuts that's crazy for a game only available on the PlayStation 5, and the PlayStation 5's only been out for like four years, that's that's sick. Final Fantasy 16, another game that charted well, did good on the charts, and it bolstered up PlayStation's lineup. And Square Enix said, you know, despite the the, the, the woes that the company has had, um, Final Fantasy 16 was of, of their successes that fiscal year. All right. That brings us to Forspoken. Look, I love Forspoken. I think it got a raw deal, but there ain't no denying. Forspoken was a flop. You know, we tried to argue. I've tried to make arguments for it, but it's, it was a flop. The studio was closed after it, afterwards and disbanded, and that's that. It did not do what it needed to do. I don't even know if, it, if it's out of the red yet. I still think it's a great game, but it's a flop. Flop is a flop, all right? And last but certainly not least, God, least God of War Ragnarok. 
Come on. We know that charted good. And that did gangbusters as well. Now, some of you may be looking at Last of Us Remake. You're like, well, we got a remake up there. Okay, let's get rid of Last of Us Remake and let's put freaking Horizon Forbidden West or Gran Turismo 7 up to both charted well did numbers and again bolstered up the playstation lineup okay so when you look at those last 10 games right the last 10 exclusives from playstation that they've invested in that they talk about that yoshida talked about in their approach from even 10 years ago eight of them did good or better and only two of them were flops that's concord and forespoken that's an 80 percent success rate that's double the percentage that they said that they needed in order to see, see success in their business strategy and i think it's because of that in particular this generation that they're seeing is the reason why when you look at playstation's uh stronger life to date spin that's why i think it's bigger because even though every single exclusive didn't sell a gazillion copies they bolstered up the playstation marketplace that's what they're meant to do again if the bait can sell well on its own that's great if it doesn't it doesn't matter this is the litmus that you need to put it up against did it do well individually to help bolster up the lineup and sell more consoles and the proof is in the pudding over the course of time that these 10 exclusives came out yes even the flippity flop flop concord and the flippity flop for spoken playstation annihilated xbox annihilated them let's stop with the foolery okay now Let's address the question of, well, MM, things change because the games and services, and service and games, and games and service, right? So that 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 uh that article from 10 years ago, it doesn't apply. Okay. This proves right here why Xbox enthusiasts or at worst fanboys need to get out of their own echo chamber. You need to listen to people that you don't even agree with because you might come across something that's not being shared in your echo chamber that will totally change your perspective and help bring you closer to the truth. I do it all the time. There are pro PlayStation, I mean pro Xbox um, podcasts, even podcasts that hate on cloud gaming. I listen to them and I learn from them. You got to have a well-rounded perspective instead of always listening to someone that's going to preach to the choir. With that being said, let, let, let's address this. In order to understand why that notion is fake and false, that, oh, no, things change, things change. You got to know the timeline. So let's go through the timeline, okay? On, strat on PlayStation's games as a service strategy and why that's not their current strategy. Let's go over it. First and foremost, January 2022, the APK deal was announced. APK deal was a huge thing. How huge was it? Check this out. APK was so huge that just in the announce of it, Sony lost 20 billion in market evaluation in the Japanese market. 20 billion just because the deal was announced. I did the research. It took them two years to get that market value back. That's how serious just the announcement of the APK deal was to Sony. So you can imagine the, the panic that it caused at Sony. So yes, describing Sony as panicked about this at the announcement at first, yes, was absolutely, uh, was the right way to describe it back then. But this is business and things change rapidly. Because remember, Jim Ryan had that email where he was told, where he told to one person, hey look, I, I talked to, to Phil, they're not looking to make this exclusive. They're, 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 you know, they they just did this to, you know, expand their their publisher thing. I don't even think it was a great deal or whatever, right? You know, and feel. I mean, and, and Jim misunderstood what the intent was back then, right? So Jim, in this process, realizing, hey, I misunderstood what they were going to do because he was sent something. He was sent an email from Phil Spencer in regards to them only giving them ABK games exclusive for a few years altogether. So Jim attempts to address that in May of 2022. 
and he sent out some terms to Phil Spencer to say, hey, look, how about we do this instead, right? While Jim realizes, hold on, Xbox might be, or Microsoft might be trying to play hardball, in July of 2022, they acquire Bungie. Now, in August of 2022, Phil Spencer responds to Jim Ryan's request. And here's what he has to say. This is courtesy of the court documents. This is August 26, 2022. He says, Jim, thanks for your response. As I stated to you in my emails and our calls, Sony is an important distributor of Activision content. We would like to find a way to maintain the relationship once we've closed the Activision acquisition. I continue to stand by the written agreement I sent you January 31st, 2022. So right after the deal was mentioned, he said, within my signature memorializing our commitment to Sony, the agreement will keep all existing Activision console titles on Sony, including future versions of Call of Duty franchise or any other uh, current Activision franchise on Sony through December 31st, 2027. So that wasn't, we, we, we talked about it being six years, I'm only a five year deal for the most part. Ugh. So yeah, that sent Sony into a panic. Guess what happens after that, short time after that. April 2023, PlayStation acquires Firewalk Studios, which is building an original AAA multiplayer game, which we now know is Concord. All right. Then in May of 2023, PlayStation invests more in live service than single player station game. It's, re it's revealed that Back in 2019, Sony was investing 88% of his budget in single player games with 12% allocated for live service games because they always talked about shoring up their live service games. But once the ABK deal happened, they panicked and they went to overdrive under Jim Ryan with live service games. This year, which was 2023, the publisher expects just 45% of its budget in traditional games and a bigger 55% in live service. So yes, did they panic? Yeah, because PlayStation, uh, Xbox was playing hardball. As soon as the deal was announced, you can see that Phil sent them a memorandum saying, we're gonna commit to you till 2027. That sent them in a panic, why? Because when you look at the most played games on Xbox and PlayStation, they are these, they're, they're games as a service titles. Yes, as Xbox or PlayStation releases an exclusive, it may be there temporarily, PlayStation's uh, games hover around more than Xboxes, but the main business again, as I showed you earlier, is third-party games. And games as a service games like Call of Duty and Overwatch create a huge bulk of the revenue on PlayStation and Xbox. So losing not only Overwatch, but Call of Duty, it's big, big, big money maker sent Sony into a panic. That's what Jim Ryan was saying and in, in when he said we couldn't recover. For those of you that don't understand business, he wasn't saying we could never recover as a business. He's saying the, if, if this is exclusive or if we don't, if, if we're not able to work in the partnership that we were before, we are never going to be able to recover the revenue that we got from particularly Call of Duty. Now, some of that may have been over-exaggerated or whatever. Some of it may have not been. But that's what he was referring to, Call of Duty. So that sent him into a panic. Now, with that said, Sony closes, I mean, Microsoft finally closes the ABK, but they had to make some big concessions, 10 year deals and all this other stuff on the cloud, stuff that they didn't want to do. And then you could tell they got those financial charts as being told by everybody, by Tim Dog. We had Mag on there. Everybody saying they looked at the finances of Activision Blizzard and they're like, hold on. The lifeblood of Activision Blizzard is Sony. With all these contingencies we got to make, how crappy our legacy stuff does, and the fact that this is the lifeblood of Activision Blizzard, we can't take these games off of here. As a matter of fact, Phil, why don't you put our legacy content on there? Grab Sea of Thieves and whatever else is back there. Frost them on Windows. <laughs> 
And after all that has come to fruition, in February 2024, PlayStation does something that a lot of us didn't like to see. They do, um, they lay some people off. And I took snippets here of what Herman Holst said, what their new strategy was going forward because they announced that half of those live service games that they were so heavy on and want people to know that they're working on live service in lieu of the ABK deal. Now that ABK is no longer a threat of leaving PlayStation, that's what they did. They cut six of those games. PlayStation 5, Herman Holt says, is, is, in, is in his fourth year. And this is February 27, 2024. And these are excerpts from this. We're going to talk about this more in detail on the live podcast. PlayStation 5 is in its fourth year, and we are at a stage where we need to step back and look at what our business needs. Delivering the immersive, narrative-driven stories that PlayStation Studios is known for at the quality bar that we aspire to requires a revaluation of how we operate. But growth itself is not an ambition. We looked at our studios and portfolio, evaluating projects in various stages of development, and... Uh, have decided that some of these projects will not move forward. Okay. So why did, what did I go through that whole spiel for? To tell you guys that yes, there was a time where PlayStation was panicked because they thought ABK was going away. But now that ABK isn't going nowhere, Now that Xbox, because of all the stipulations and stuff that were applied to the APK deal and how poorly their legacy content is doing in its own ecosystem, now that they realize they need PlayStation more than ever now after APK, they don't care about games as a service as they used to. They still have ties to games as a service because that major investment that they made in 2023, they had to borrow money for that. So they made a calculation and said, hey, look, what can we salvage from this to pay back this money that we owe? And they decide, and they probably looked at their portfolio and looked over the games that were ready to, to go, and they decided to go with them. And it looks like in 2024, they really didn't have a whole bunch of first party stuff to go along. Concord was, you know, went through eight years of development. I can't believe that, but it went through eight, it was ready to go. They said, we might as well keep this one. But as you, if you look at Concord, what does Concord look like, y'all? Concord looks like an Overwatch ripoff. And they no longer care if Overwatch is duplicated or copied because they still got Overwatch on their system. You understand? Do you see now? This is all makes sense now. Are you now out of your Xbox funk now and you can see more clear? So yeah, is Concord a massive failure at this moment? Is it likely to remain that way? Uh, yeah. But is it causing PlayStation panic more so than embarrassment? I would say no. I mean, or do, is it like, ah, man, it doesn't do anything. It's not doing any well. Oh, my God. We don't care. I mean, of course, it's a loss. They pay a lot of money for it. They're not happy about it. But is it vital to their success? No. As you saw in the comments from Herman Holst, they went back to their old strategy that wasn't so relying on games as a service. That's why they slashed half of them. They're going to try to attempt to make the money back that they borrow and, and, you know, and keep on moving. See, had they been in a place where ABK was going to threaten their top 20 played games, then yeah, games as a service would have mattered. Concord would have been more vital. But now ABK is going nowhere. Especially again with them realizing their survival is dependent upon PlayStation and that PlayStation marketplace, that old mighty PlayStation marketplace. Those concerns are no more. What you see now are attempts to deal with temporary margin loss by milking IPs, by either placing them on PCs or doing these weird behind deals with Horizon and Lego, you know what I mean? And then, like I said, using the remaining. Um, games as a service titles that are ready to go to try to get back some of that money that they took for investments. All right. So in closing, simply put, 
we went through this exhaustively so hopefully this all gets you out of your funk and this all makes sense exclusives matter they make gaming all the more better due to the unique risk put into them that you will not get from your typical third-party studios you're, you're just not going to see a third-party studio operate off a 60 percent failure rate absolutely not but that's how critical it is for playstation to try to find the biggest and baddest um exclusive title to you know boost up its its exclusive lineup altogether and use that money to make investments into other exclusives it's all a cyclical event when you have quality exclusives they provide way more value than bargain bin attempts we've seen simply fail this generation and i get that a lot of you are new to this and simply were not aware of the dynamics put forth in this video the only thing i can say and trust me i don't want to sound like some cocky i told you so braggart but I suggest a little less fanboy rhetoric content. I suggest stepping away from consuming that and a little more MM2K gaming. Simply put, we got over 40 years of gaming experience here. And had you been following our content, even from years ago, even before the launch of this generation, and following the advice of this channel faithfully, like I said, even before this, this generation launched, None of these shocking events from Xbox would have been, well, shocking. And that's it from your boy. Let me know what you think about all this in the comment section below. Like I always say, who cares what I think? But if you did like what I had to say, check out the links below. Follow me. They will lead you to Hard Knock Digital Culture, Cloud Doses, and MM2K Gaming. If you are listening to this as part of the NRO mic check, sit tight. We're starting soon. But if you are listening to this as an a la carte video, click that box to your left and it'll connect you to the podcast. With that said, have a wonderful gaming day. Peace.